thank you all. I'd like to welcome all, all of you guests, friends, supporters, future supporters. Uh, thanks for joining us today. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, uh, I'm Eric Olson. I'm the director of the Lands and Rivers for the Nature Conservancy here in New Jersey. Uh, in these really tr incredibly trying times right now, we're delighted to bring this series of the virtual events to you. Uh, while we would, uh, we're doing some really exciting work here in New Jersey, and while our preference would be to bring you to the to the work in the fields, um, we're we're more than happy to bring our projects directly into your home. So this is a unique way of, of doing it. We've designed uh, this program to be as interactive as we possibly could. Uh, a couple of logistics uh, to orient you. Uh, we will have some time uh, throughout this program for, for Q&A. We have a couple of stage stopping points. Um, and then of course, at, at the end of the program, um, everyone, as you can see, is currently muted. Uh, if you have questions along the way, if you can enter those questions uh, in the chat feature, if you go all the way to the bottom of the, the Zoom toolbar, there'll be a toolbar that pops up and right in the center of the screen, there is a chat feature. So just click on that and <clears throat> just send your questions in. We'll be curating that along the way. And of course, we'll, we'll answer as many questions as we have um, as possible that we have time with. Um, if you wanna see Beth when she's speaking in the upper right hand corner, there is a, just click on the speaker view when, when, she's, uh, when she's presenting. Now, what I've learned over the last few months in this, in this current situation is that conservation work is more important and more critical than ever before. The health of our, our planet is incredible. We have a really wonderful program planned today. You're going to get a glimpse of our ambitious and cutting edge work to restore rivers in the U.S. and, uh, and in New Jersey. And uh, I'd like to introduce Beth Styler Berry, uh, who will be leading you on that journey today. She's our Director of River Restoration. Uh, for TNC in New Jersey, and she's got her hands in working with uh, colleagues in other states as well. She's led river restoration and dam removal work efforts in multiple rivers in New Jersey, and has personally managed the, the successful removal of seven dams in the state, uh, probably um, is, is up there, probably more than anyone else in, in our great state, uh, and re reconnected many miles of, of river habitat in the state. We owe a, a debt of gratitude for that. Um, I'm happy to call her a colleague. She is one of the small number of individuals that you meet who is at the top of her field, uh, and you're in for a treat today. Um, and so with that, I'll, I'll turn it over to Beth to, to give you a glimpse at our of, of river restoration work in New Jersey. Well, thank, thank you for the very kind words, Eric. Um, so today, we're going to start off with a quick look at the global situation. We're going to take a couple minutes on the situation in the United States. We're gonna zoom in on New Jersey. Then I'm gonna show you some before and afters of the Columbia work, which I'm sure that you haven't seen before because they're hot off the press. Um, and then we're gonna take two little trips into side projects that are running alongside the big Columbia Dam project. Okay, so here is that global snapshot. And this, little infographic here shows um, both the size of the river by showing the thickness or, or um, thinness of the line. And I think it's kind of natural that the, those blue rivers are the ones that are fully connected and healthy. The green ones have good connectivity and then the most impacted rivers are shown in red. So let me just give you, um, I'm Sure, you can see my cursor. Eric, you want to give me a nod here? You can see me moving along this uh, river here. Okay, so this is the Nile. So we see a nice thick red line for a big river and we see unfortunately a pretty dark red, meaning it's very impacted. Versus down here where we see lots of what almost looks like pink because we're looking at several smaller rivers that are impacted. I think one thing um, that kind of stands out to me when I look at this map is that you're almost looking at a population map, right? So where there are people, there are impacted rivers. And unfortunately, you could take a, a look at the U.S. here and you see, you know, large rivers, very impacted. So, you know, we certainly have work cut out for us. So here's that look at the United States. And 14,000 of the 90,000, roughly 90,000 uh, dams in um, the states are high hazard. So those dams in red have a potential um, 
with failure or misoperation to cause uh, loss of human life or serious property damage. And um, just um, to interrupt our regularly scheduled programming, we're gonna take a super quick dive into one of these, two of these red dots here in light of today's news. I thought that we could um, take a look. Um, I'm sure that most of you have heard that there are two major dam failures in uh, Michigan right now. Um, where there's flooding up to uh, expected nine feet of flooding in the city itself. And there are, there's a major Dow chemical plant right on the riverbank. And I think it was interesting in this, if you want to look it up in the Detroit News is the article that I looked at that was just chock full of interesting information, including the fact that these two dams have both been found um, to be out of compliance for about 14 years. And that finally in 2018, FERC did revoke their licenses, um, but that they were still operating and generating power. Um, and that of the, the, the particular journalists, I'm sorry, I don't have the name on here, um, looked at 45 states and Michigan was 20th in um, this number of dams, high hazard dams in this kind of condition. So they're not even the worst of the worst. They're kind of middling in, in this situation. And here's just a quick look at those two dams. Um, this on is the Edenfield on the right, and this is a Sanford, sorry, on the left, and then the Sanford on the right. Um, and this is, you know, this is literally unfolding right now. These dams are failing, spillways are collapsing, and city flooding. Uh, so, you know, this is this is a real situation. It's not something that, you know, is crazy, will never happen. Actually, in the article, the uh, the owners of these dams, uh, in one of their statements to FERC, said that there was a five or ten in a million chance that any of these dams would fail. So they, I guess they got double lucky or unlucky. Um, Okay, so again, nationwide with those roughly 90,000 dams, about 1,600 have been removed since 1912, and about 100 of those were removed in 2018. So you can see down in this corner, in the first half of the last decade, dam removals ran to about 50 or 60 a year. And as we creep into the second half of the most recent decade, you see it moving to the 60s, 70s, and even 80s per year with the most recent number of 2018 being 99 dams. So you can see the number of dam removals across the country gradually creeping up, which is you know, what we want to encourage. Um, focusing in a little bit on New Jersey, we have more than 1,700 dams that are regulated by the Bureau of Dam Safety, and about a third of those are high and significant potential hazard dams. So one in every three carries the risk of uh, loss of human life or property. Then we have something else, and this is cross country, not just in New Jersey, but called hazard creep. So if you built a dam in 1950, it might have been ranked as a low hazard dam because there was nothing downstream. In between it's getting built and now, there can be several housing developments downstream or strip malls, highways, things like that downstream but yet the dams are not necessarily reclassified in light of that development. So we do find that we have dams that are classified um, as low or middle hazards that are actually higher hazard when you look at the current actual on the ground standard. Um, and that in, this is New Jersey, back to New Jersey, that each one of the higher hazard dams has to have um, a, an emergency action plan associated with it but that um, our Bureau of Dam Safety has found that only 20% of those emergency action plans have actually been implemented, although we have had um, several times in the last five years when they should have been. Um, and then last but not least, in the last five years, um, New Jersey's Bureau of Dam Safety has reported 13 failures, as well as several overtopping events. So dam failures do in fact happen in New Jersey, closer to home. Um, I'm not gonna dwell too much on why we remove dams because I feel a little bit like I'm preaching to the choir here, but we'll just touch on the fact that they are both safety and security risks as we see again unfolding in Michigan today. Um, and then the ecological uplift is almost un 
matched by any other restoration technique, and that is the immediate reconnection of a river system, um, allowing resident and migratory species to, to move up and down the stream, um, restoring river processes, and then something that we kind of want to look at separately is um, what is the importance of that through the lens of climate change? So one important thing is that as climate changes and weather patterns change, um, being released from a dam allows the river's channel to naturally shift and move through a floodplain better as those situations um, change. And then um, just a couple of citations here for the fact that dams, uh, they deprive wetlands, downstream wetlands of sediment that would normally replenish them. And that uh, lessens the ability of those uh, features to act as, as carbon sinks. And also the reservoirs behind each impoundment contributes to global warming. We need to better understand the effect of um, these reservoirs on the global carbon cycle and Earth's climate. And that is something that I think we're gonna see people dive into more and more um, in the upcoming years. So sometimes when you think of that, you think, well, how much could any, you know, how much can the reservoir behind a dam actually matter? Well, when you see this amount of dams from coast to coast, you can understand that if these dams are denying downstream wetlands of sediment and if they are acting as um, temperature sinks, then yes, you know, cumulatively, it's pretty easy to see how that would be an impact. Um, last thing I want to mention on um, kind of the global or national um, scale is that sometimes people will ask us, especially as conservationists, you know, why are you not promoting dams as hydropower, as a, a green source of power. And the fact is that um, the number, you know, if we wanted to do that, right, there are plenty of dams in, in place where we could actually, you know, work to energize those dams. This is non-power dams with a capacity of greater than one megawatt with the dot being sized to, you know, how much greater than that one megawatt. So if we wanted to, we wouldn't have to build dams, we could power these dams. So take a look at this, th these dams that might be worthwhile for hydropower versus this, okay? So we see that we're dropping out lots and lots of these dams that would not even be useful to generate power when we look at modern power needs. Okay, so we're gonna take our closer look at New Jersey. And what you're seeing on the left is all of New Jersey's dams. So again, top to bottom and uh, Delaware coast to, to East Coast pretty much covered. Um, again, you can almost see that population um, density accompanied by, by dams that were used to power the state during its early years. And on the right, you're seeing which dams would create the biggest bang for the buck ecologically. So remember, there are other things to consider like safety and flooding. Um, but when we look at them for ecological purposes, uh, you see the red and the yellow as the biggest bang for the buck ecologically to have these dams removed. And it's not surprising that they, um, the, the highest value dams are the ones that run uh, closest to the coast. And that reflects the importance of being able to uh, reintroduce fish migration at those areas. So I, I know that Eric asked up front for you guys to put any questions um, into the Q&A box and I wanted to stop now just to see if, you know, up to this point, if folks had questions, I, I can take a, a few minutes. No questions yet. No Post questions into yet. the chat if you have any. Okay. All righty. So now we're gonna take the Columbia check-in. And this is a little different than what you've probably seen. Even if you've seen <clears throat> updates on Columbia, you probably haven't seen it quite like this. Um, I wanted to just take a minute. I know that most of you are pretty familiar with this site, but I want to take a minute to just reorient you because it's important that when I show you these photos, you, you kind of remember where exactly we are. So down here is the Delaware River, and here's the Columbia Dam. Here's the Route 80 overpass, and that pinch gives us our lower impoundment and our upper impoundment. 
Then we have the Warrington Road Bridge, which is about a mile upstream of the Columbia Dam. And then we have the Brugler Road Bridge, which is about a mile and a half. So in this series of photos that I'm going to show you, we're going to start at the top at Brugler Road and work our way down. Beth, we do have one question. Okay. From Neha Savant. Uh, what factors went into the ecological prioritization of dam removals in New Jersey? Um, so the presence or absence of migratory species and I, I want to say how, how valuable those might be, you know, um, how, how much they're in need of connected rivers to, to succeed. Um, also, you know, what lies downstream, right? So you're not going to have a big bang for the buck if you take out a dam that has two stream, you know, downstream dams. Also, I think, and I'm, I'm might be, your real person for a good answer here is Ellen. She's the, <laughs> She's the wizard on the on the modeling there, um, but also things like the um, the landscape, the watershed that it lies in. So the the general health of of that. Um, okay. Another so, question, if you don't mind, or we can no, wait. If, no, go ahead. Okay, this one's from Susan Dunn. Does it always make sense to remove dams from the end back to the source, like the way we're doing the pollen skill removal? So that is definitely. Um, the easiest way to get funded in general, because if you're going to go to a funder and say, give me, you know, a whole bunch of money to take this dam out, but there's still two downstream, you're not going to generate a lot of excitement. Um, there are certain cases in which you can show that downstream dams are, you know, in fact underway and under study for removal, that you might be able to, um, you know, to, to make that case, but, you know, logic dictates that we move that way so that we can gradually introduce more spawning ground and more feeding grounds for migratory species but also just the you know the nitty-gritty of getting funded you really need to to work your way up there are you know there are certainly um exceptions to that rule and i've, I've worked on an exception where there were you know more than a half dozen dams downstream but the, the things stars lined up right that made sense to, to take one dam out um at that particular moment Anything else? Not right now. Okay, all right, so we're gonna start at the top. And what you're gonna see here is what Brugler Road, looking downstream, remember we're a mile and a half, what it looked like in 2016. Bank, bank, no water. And now what you see, this is only two weeks ago, if you're standing on the bridge and taking in that same vista. So imagine for just a minute that you are a fish, right? Or anything else that needs to live and breathe underwater. I mean, what really jumps out in that little 10 second video is the amount of oxygen that we now have in the stream, right? Um, I see a couple of other features, things like, um, you know, those, those sort of um, still areas and more highly oxygenated places for species to rest on, you know, if they're migrating. So definitely a whole lot here more to offer habitat wise um, than, than existed before. Now we're gonna make one uh, little short trip downstream to Warrington Road. And again, we're gonna look upstream from this bridge first. This is 2016. Again, it looks like a pond. And this is just a few weeks ago. So if you have vertigo, you might wanna hold on because we're going to dip down and then back up. Um, but I would like to see through the water that nice, interesting um, rocky bottom versus the muddy and mucky bottom that we had before. And then looking a little bit into the distance, we can see actually another ripple forming upstream. So one just upstream from the bridge, and now we have another um, ripple. But I want to use this shot um, to point out something else that may or may not be quite as obvious as those two things. And that's, you know, um, habitat right on the edge here. So all of the edge habitats, pretty much wherever you're looking at, that, that tends to be some of the highest value habitat that we have. So whether you're in a wetland pond um, or in a, you know, in a regular stream, the, the, this edging here is important not only for aquatic organisms, but for mammals that might be using this to, to feed. So all of this area here that is now exposed that was not is now, 
you know, a, a nice, diverse, high value habitat. We even have some um, vegetation in the stream. Tree in the stream is a great thing. It's, it's interesting habitat. And then over here, you can see some deeper water. So again, from that, you know, just kind of stagnant, still water, we now have introduced several valuable habitats. So now we're on the same bridge, just looking downstream, and it's the same kind of thing. 2016, on, and now we see all of those features. Again, we're gonna take a look at the bottom, and you can see you know, all of that great edge habitat, and you can see that you know, great gravel and rocky bottom for spawning and for feeding. So we've you know, really kind of upped the, um, the interest here for, for all sorts of species. So now we're going to be in that upper impoundment, the, the whole area that we showed you before. This is a drone shot prior to any lowering or removal. And you can see the whole upper impoundment, Route 80, the lower impoundment, and out to the Delaware River. Um, I'm going to show you another shot from here in a minute. But here it is in 2019. This is from Bill Levin's um, an aerial shot. And you can see the river now winding through that area under 80 and back out to the Delaware and about 25 acres of brand new floodplain habitat. So that area that I pointed to before, here it is before lowering. Remember that rock? Because, no, oh, there we go. Okay, so now that rock, instead of sitting in a pool of still water, is at the edge of a flowing stream and right across from about 25 acres of newly planted with 9,000 trees or somewhere in that rough number. It's always always increasing, so it's hard to keep up. But you can see again, just a huge, you know, whether you are a fox or a frog or a turtle or a shad, you know, this is just an entirely new world. So the next shot that I'm gonna show you is one that's probably super familiar to you. I just want you to, to know that the camera is in pretty much exactly the same location through all of these shots. So here it is, Old, uh, old Faithful. So that is, you know, what you would have seen right up until the spring of 2018. Now we see Flo. This guy just took a swim. You can see he's dripping water across the, the bank. We see all that newly planted floodplain. Um, again, all sorts of creatures, not just fish that are going to swim through here now that would have been blocked before, but all sorts of uh, creatures find this an interesting spot day and night. So you see um, another visitor coming to get a drink and uh, look around, see what he might, uh, what he might catch. And then last but not least, uh, this guy wanted to come very close right into the camera. And in a second, if you can read his lips, he says, thank you very much. So that is what it looks like if you're down at the Columbia Dam now. It, you know, again, was just a big, you know, big giant blockage. And now it's like a happening place to be if you're, you know, either an organism living in the stream or near the stream. Okay, so I'm going to shift gears now and go to one of those two little side projects. Well, not so little, but two side projects. Oh. Excuse me, Beth? Yes? What was the last critter that we just saw on camera? That was a big buck. Mm, okay. Yeah. So I actually, there's lots and lots of, of deer on those uh, cameras day and night. Some of them swimming, feeding, just hanging out. So <clears throat> I really did want to take a minute to thank, you know, all of the folks that contributed to that gigantic huge and ongoing project and I hope that those before and afters which you know usually when we talk about Columbia we get you know kind of into the nitty-gritty of construction and everything but I just wanted to take a minute um, you know to let folks who have been such a big part of this actually um, see you know the real the visual change the, the matter of fact and on the ground change um, and so now I'm going to shift gears and we are going to talk about mussels. Um, mussels are endangered across the country and basically across the world. So this is an animal that is really struggling to survive. Um, they, cannot they cannot escape changing water temperatures. They cannot 
escape pollution. They're kind of stuck there. You guys saw, hopefully saw, had a chance to see that little video that was sent out. Um, they are sort of stuck there um, and subject to the whims of those who control or help or harm the, <clears throat> the river that they live in. And another interesting thing about these creatures is that um, they have very specific host fish. And if that host fish moves on because of temperature or pollution or gets disconnected from an area because of a dam or a culvert, um, then it doesn't matter how, you know, the, the, the uh, muscle can no longer reproduce. It's lost the, a key link in its, in its ability to reproduce. So I thought that we might follow this one triangle floater. You can see the number, sorry, I'm trying to move my, my pictures, which is number 331. We're gonna follow muscle number 331 through um, the next couple of slides. We, <clears throat> at Columbia, we had a whole bunch of different species of mussels. Um, we had four state threatened mussels. So those were of particular interest for us to protect um, through our project. So we had a firm, Biodiversity, come in and do a mussel survey for us so that we could understand exactly what we had there and where they were. And then they actually came in and moved those state threatened species for us when they occurred in, you know, areas that would have been under construction or, or too close to the dam itself or where we thought that they may be harmed because of the amount of sediment moving through the site. So um, the mussels were gathered up in bags and then they were transported to one of three locations. One of them, one of the relocation sites was in the Delaware River and one of, and I'm sorry, two of them were in the Paulins Kill. So for every state listed species, the biologist, you know, actually picked each one up, noted the condition of the shell, the size of the shell, and each one got tagged. So you can imagine this is not, you know, this is not an easy critter to even find in the first place, I would think, <clears throat> let alone um, handle and, and tag and track. So after they were relocated, again, they were relocated prior to construction to make sure that the most imminent danger that they would face, they didn't have to face, um, so the tag muscles were checked twice after relocation. Once was about a month after relocation, and then again about a year after relocation. And we had um, what we feel. What? Um, <clears throat> okay, here's um, the entire a mug shot for every single muscle that was um, moved. Every single one got tagged. Um, and we had what we feel was a, a pretty successful, here's our number 331 tagged and located here one month prior to relocation, one year, after, sorry, one month after relocation, one year after relocation, and then we can see that it did have growth during that one year. Um, a few of them, unfortunately, were found and were deceased and a few of them were not relocated. Um, reasons for not being found can be that the muscle itself actually, you know, does pick up and, and move stakes or that it was the subject of prey, you know, by another animal that, that eats mussels for a living. So um, we felt that we were pretty successful with removing most of the mussels from the threat and then when we look at the outcome of our project, which will be an additional mile and a half of good habitat, um, is something that in the long term, you know, is going to absolutely benefit those, those muscles. Um, okay, I think I'd like to pause here and see if there are any muscle questions. Beth, no muscle questions yet, but I do have a question going back to the Dam removal. Okay. If you could just remind us again, how much river and tributary did the removal of the dam open up? The removal of the dam opened 10 miles of main stem and about another 10 miles of tributary. So about 20 miles reopened to resident and migratory fish for feeding and spawning and just like. Okay. Anything else? Nothing at the moment. Okay. 
All right, now we are going into drones. And this is, you know, the, the most te technical part of the presentation. So we're just probably, um, probably six or seven slides from the end of the presentation. It will get a little bit more technical here. I can almost um, probably be able to hear my muted drone team members probably ready to jump up and correct me when I misspeak here, but hopefully they'll be patient um, to the end. I want to really thank our drone team. Um, we have three pilots, Chuck, Bill, and Rich Rogers, and we have uh, one of our supporters and gophers is Tim Johnson. We have a bunch of folks from Princeton Hydro, and I have to give just a giant shout out to Princeton Hydro here who has been doing all of the drone work pro bono for us, um, which has been a huge thing. This, this piece of the project would not have been possible to run alongside of the Columbia Dam removal. We just, you know, we don't have the people or the technical expertise to actually get where we need to be to make this worthwhile without Princeton Hydro. Uh, and then we have uh, some folks from the Nature Conservancy on this team. So it's, um, everybody's got uh, different skills and uh, I think we pulled it off and, and made a, a worthwhile effort here. Um, so in general, people use drones and, and we do as well on the Columbia and other removals as a way to just kind of look at pictures, right? So that we can show one another things, we can show, um, you know, our supporters, the community, regulators, you know, other people that we're working with, the construction folks, the engineers. In this particular video that you're seeing, um, at this point in time, when we took this drone uh, video, we could not get out to this area that we needed to see. We simply couldn't get out there. It was, you know, so mucky that it was unsafe to walk on. But we did need to see this feature. So we were able to put a drone up and then have a big phone call with the construction folks, the engineers and our regulators and talk about, you know, how, how should we address <clears throat> this feature that we were seeing. So again, these before and after kind of things and monitoring is a very typical use of drones. Um, we wanted to see if we could kind of go a step beyond. So we used something called photogrammetry, which basically means taking hundreds it could be close to a thousand photos of something and feeding that in and creating a 3D image from those photos. So the input here is photos and the output is a 3D model. And the very special thing about this, I mean, what you're looking at looks like an image, right? It looks like a snapshot from a drone, but in fact, it has been created from, in this case, about 600 or 700 photographs and because we are sure of the location of each one of those photographs that went into this composite, we can measure very accurately from this. So it's not, it's definitely a couple of steps beyond just having a photograph. It, it's, you know, I, I always think of it as a, a math picture, right? It's a picture made out of math that allows us to measure from one point to another or even to subtract um, from one point to another to, to help us better understand changes. Um, what you're seeing here is the flight path. This happens to be of the lower impoundment. Um, so a, a beauty of the software that we've been using um, is that you can put in a flight path and the next time that you go out to fly a drone mission, you're kind of almost just hitting go and the drone is going to repeat exactly what it has done. So at this point, we have flown exactly this pattern that you're looking at seven times in the last year and a half or so. So every time we go out there, we're getting the exact same shots from the same point and that allows us to move, you know, to measure last October versus this October in a, in a standardized way, if you will. So here is another shot. This is actually a, a screen capture from the software that's used. And in this, again, you see those photo points, if you will, overlaying on the image that is eventually created. Um, and the image is created by taking a couple of different shots from each point so that we get the 3D, the, the more of the topography there. Um, 
And this is something that one of our team members, Nigel, um, can then use to create an animated version of those pictures. So again, and I think that comes up next. So what I'm going to show you now is going to look again like a flyover video. What it is, is one of those images, again, made by six or seven hundred photographs being put together and then um, Nigel or whoever's doing the animation can then fly over that math picture, if you will. And you'll see as you fly over, um, you can even see the details down to the tree tubes. So this is post planting and you see those thousands of tree tubes. You see the river, you can see some other features of, you know, the, the road on the side some of the planting that, that regenerated on its own and we're flying up toward the Warrington Road Bridge, which you'll see. But again, you know, you're seeing a computer generated image that has not only the usefulness of allowing us to, to see in 3D, but also allows us to measure. Um, so what exactly did we want to measure? Our goal was to see if we could accurately measure floodplain habitat and um, water lost or storage gained, depending on how you look at it, right? How much space of that old impoundment dropped that could be replaced with, for example, flood water or just be gained habitat. We wanted to be able to measure the changing channel area, vegetation growth, and um, some sediment, sedimentation and volumetric changes as the, um, and we're, we have been doing that. We're able to do that. See how as the floodplain dewaters and consolidates over time, we can see that um, floodplain change in shape. And what we wanted to know is that would the quality of this information be good enough for us to, you know, I mean, it's one thing to um, have an engineer go out there every month and measure these things, you know, it's just, you, you just can't possibly afford to do that. I mean, there's, there's, I can't imagine a restoration project that could have somebody go out and have an engineer go out and monitor that frequently. Just budget does not exist for that sort of thing. So if we could replace that with drone missions, great. Um, we also wanted to know was the, would the information be good enough that it would help us to make decisions on, on management, like mid project, can, can we really get that good of a measurement? And then eventually we'd like to be able to answer permitting questions or questions from regulators with this information. So one of the things that, um, that we use to help make sure that we have really good numbers is to use something called a ground control point. Most of you are familiar with um, GPS work. So what you see here in the center is a point, and here you can see Casey from Princeton Hydro um, GPSing that very accurately. But the point that we're gonna ask the computer to look at, we're gonna say this point in the center, we know exactly where that is. This other black and white surround here is just a target to help us pick up the location of that visually when we look at the drone work. And this here all the way on the left is what that looks like if you haven't been out in the field in a couple months. So we actually needed the GPS in this case to even begin to locate the old points because they, they got so overgrown. So there is, you know, there is a labor intensive side of this that we're kind of learning as we go the best and most efficient way for us to to work on these things. So the, the use of the ground control points is very important to help us to kind of calibrate to, to reality, right? So we get a picture that's almost floating in air unless we can tie it down to known locations on the earth. So what um, the ground control points do is they help to tighten up the numbers that we're getting to the, to the real picture. And you can see here the orange blocks are numbers that have not been corrected for the ground control points versus the round blue circles that have been corrected. And the closer that we can get those blue circles to that line is the closer that we are to exact. So every team kind of has to make a decision about, you know, how good is good enough. And for us, since we're basically measuring things like acres and, you know, feet or inches, if you were going to try to measure millimeters, you'd have to really up your game. Um, but we're, we're definitely within a, a comfort zone. Another thing that we did here was to um, change 
to see whether or not if we changed equipment halfway through or partway through, would we have a problem? Is there enough of a difference between drones and cameras that it would be a problem for our team? So um, thinking about monitoring, which we hope is gonna take five or seven years, we wondered if we had to replace drones and you probably will, right? These are kind of high tech pieces of equipment. They're not gonna have a lifetime of more than five years. And also um, in the case of this poor drone right here that has a, a broken leg and uh, snapped off something else there, um, you know, we wanted to see would we be able to swap out pieces of equipment and maintain our, um, our project as we went along. So we did use two different drones, a Phantom and a Mavic Pro. And we looked at, you know, both the qualitative work, is it gonna give us, you know, image wise, is it gonna give us something that is comparable? And you can see there's difference in focal length, difference in camera. Um, and we kind of ran the two um, analysis side by side. And we did find that there, again, there might be some error involved in just switching out pieces of equipment. But once again, we found that that's um, something that we could be comfortable with. And here what you're seeing is the actual elevation of a ground point and how the, the uh, Phantom saw that ground point and how the Mavic saw it. So the difference from, you know, true, if you will, we measured and we looked at the, the, um, the square of the error there. So again, for our purposes, we feel that we could switch out um, equipment partway through. So this was some, something that we did that we call Casey versus the drone. You saw Casey before with the GPS. And what we wanted to know is, you know, when you get an engineer with top of the line equipment out there, you know, a trained, doing trained survey work, how different is that going to be than us using our drone? So what we did was to slice out a cross section from one of those big, you know, um, full upper impoundment in images that we saw, slice out a cross section there and have Casey go out with equipment and do that same cross section and then look at the two side by side and say, how, how far are we from where we would be if we had an engineer going out each time? So you can see that our, um, error is you know definitely well within so I, can, I should show you here that the circles are the drones measurement and the squares are Casey with his equipment so um, you know there could be some uh, some of the difference can be accounted for by perhaps not being exactly on the mark of the exact same spot that we pulled with a drone but again we definitely feel comfortable enough that what we're doing, answering that question, are we gonna be close enough that we can use this to measure? And we found that our answer was yes. So a couple of things that we learned in the field was that it is harder to collect data, whoops, harder to collect data over water. And there's a couple of reasons um, for that. One is that just the reflection of the water, remember the input of these, of this information is photos. So if you have reflection in your photo, um, you're gonna actually be losing a, a little chunk of data. Um, the other problem is as the software stitches together one photo with another, it kind of needs little landmarks to pull those photos together properly. And again, you're losing that over big expanses of water, something that we, that we learned. And you can see the difference that it makes flying over water in these two, this is the upper and lower impoundment, fully water before any dam removal. And here you have, when we're looking at mostly earth, you can see the difference in the clarity and the quality of um, the image that we're able to create. So we, all, we um, measured the change in floodplain. Um, and again, you see both pieces of equipment being used here. Um, so we, we came very close. It looks like about 3.8 acres gained in the lower impoundment. And our, you know, our, our estimate, if you will, was somewhere around four that we were expecting. And so we, this allows us to get out there and measure in a more accurate way than we can really kind of afford, if you, if you will, um, to do without the drone. So it's great for measuring the floodplain that we have regained um, and also allows us to look at storage um, 
gained, right? So the lighter blue there is the old water surface level and the blue is the new. So that area was, um, you know, is now open and ready to store flood water in the case of a flood. And then the yellow boxed areas are um, increased riparian habitat. So places where that heron and the fox and the deer are now using as habitat, which before would have just been the, um, the pond. So I think, yep, yeah, we're kind of at the end. And I just, you know, I want to thank folks again. And I know there are many of you on the call, but I, I just really want to, before we go on to more questions, thank you guys. Um, you've made everything that you've seen here, you've made that possible. Um, I am sure you know that the Nature Conservancy, like um, our partners, are, are heading into some challenging times that none of us could have foreseen so that we will continue to value and appreciate um, your, your help on these projects and your support going forward. Beth, we have a question. Okay. Referring to the, in the drone flyovers. Okay. What's the name of the software that you use? Sorry. Oh, that's okay. Um, Pix4D. So uh, you know, here's a here's a great um, here's a great example of uh, of the teamwork involved. So when you say the software that I use, uh, my job on the drone team is to say to people, you know what I would really like to see. You know what would be important to know? Like that's the limit of my, you know, technical expertise. I am the, the person who's saying, wouldn't it be great if we could know this? Um, Nigel has used the PIX4D to do the animations. Princeton Hydro does the calculations for us on PIX4D. Um, so that would be Christiana and Thomas. I always hate to name names because I'm going to forget somebody. And of course our pilot, so Chuck um, uses PIX4D to create the flight plan so that we can then port those numbers into the software that the folks at Princeton Hydro are going to use when they, you know, make us our maps and our calculations. Looks like we don't have any more questions. Okay. Okay. Well, Actually, I do have one question okay. uh, from Susan Dunn. How much of this have we shared with the community around the Columbia Dam? It's an amazing example of teamwork. So it, do you mean geographically the community there? Is, is that, I'm assuming that's what you mean? I think that's what she means. Okay, so I go back frequently um, to the Knowlton Township Committee. Um, at most, I let three months pass and I do share this with them. And, you know, um, there are definitely a whole bunch of very interested folks there now. They're interested in um, the new recreational area that this has opened up for the town. That's, you know, a question that I get all the time. Um, and I have to say that we have tons of help there. When we do cleanups, we get locals who are coming out to clean up. We have the Knowlton Township Environmental Committee folks coming out and planting trees. And most recently, we had the mayor and her family come out and put in some of the willow stakes in the upper impoundment. So, you know, talk about, um, you know, having the, the community kind of come around on this and seeing this as the value, you know, as having the value that we had always, you know, tried to make the case. Sometimes you need to see to believe, but I also think that, um, you know, having this fantastic example here is going to help as we do other dam removals upstream, because we don't have to ask people to guess or to imagine. We can actually show them now what success looks like on this river. Another question, how will this information be used for future dam removal projects? Is this something that will become part of the dam removal projects going forward? I definitely think that the measurements, the before and after, will be incorporated into um, not only dam removals, but it's something that I would like to see done in hyperhumus because it really gives you um, a perspective that you don't get otherwise. Um, I think 
we, you know, are learning more about this incredibly powerful tool, like, you know, being able to have the construction folks, the engineers, the regulators all, you know, look at the same thing and understand it. Um, that is something we'll use going forward. And I think that we, we learned a lot about what, what it is we want to do a little bit different next time so that we can capture this information a little bit easier. For example, when we're looking at the next, um, any of the surveying for the next dam removals, we'll be able to say, hey, let's pick a spot that is going to be best for us to come back and use the drone. But we, we could have done a better job on knowing where those cross sections could be. But, you know, you don't know until you, until you try. Mm -hmm. Uh, have perceptions of those who are opposed to the dam removal changed now that it's been removed? Yes, uh, for sure. So, and, and, you know, definitely those most vocal voices, which came really from, from Knowlton Township, have really come around. I mean, again, they're on the site as part of cleanups and tree planting, and, you know, the, they're, they're excited by what they see. So, um, you know, there, there's always going to be a contingent of folks who just are, are going to resist because that's, you know, that is their, that is um, where they feel most comfortable. Mm -hmm. But I think that, you know, for the most part, we've been able to change some hearts and minds here. And what have you been most surprised by as a result of these drone measurements? Hmm. Um, I think I'm very excited and maybe a little bit surprised at how accurate we can be. Um, I, I, I thought that it was a great wish to have, but I, I didn't really feel sure that we were gonna kind of nail it down. And certainly, you know, it's something else that we've gotten better and better at with, with guidance, um, you know, making sure that we're generating accurate numbers. I think um, the, the accuracy is, is what's surprising to me. And, I do have renewed hope that we might be able to use this um, eventually for regulators and, and permitting and things like that. I mean, that is always the big bureaucratic hump to get over, but seeing how amazing this tool can be, I think, you know, you can only deny um, something this powerful for so, for so long. Okay, and what are the next dams you are eyeing for removal? Oh, we're more than eyeing. Um, <laughs> so the next two dams upstream are the Paulina Dam and then the County Line Dam. Both of those are in different stages of beginning. The County Line is um, in the design phase. Uh, we're actually having to re, you know, kind of reconfigure design somewhat uh, because of concerns over mussels. Um, which is not surprising that there is a concern over muscles and we actually took a good early look at that. Um, so we're just trying to figure out the best way to, to work that out to the satisfaction of everyone involved. Um, so that is, you know, we're trying to get to permitting on that pretty soon. We want, we want a design ready for permit soon. Um, and on the Polina Dam, which is downstream of that, um, it's a little bit bigger of a nut to crack financially um, and, and everything. Um, that has design plans already. And if things go well on that, we're hoping to start permitting on that in a few months. And um, what were the biggest hurdles you faced in completing the project? Um, you know, every single dam has new, um, new and exciting hurdles. <laughs> um, so I, you know, for this, I would have to say on on Columbia, the biggest challenge was the the county, the county engineers, and their somewhat unrealistic expectations, um, you know, or re re requests, I should say, um, both paperwork wise, and then you know, just their you know, their timeline was very different than the timeline of folks out in the field trying to get work done. So that, you know, that was something that was, you know, pretty much out of our control and, um, and that was a challenge. It did, it, it cost us months. 
And one more, there's, this is a suggestion. Um, high school and college students in the area would be really inspired by this. Is there a way to share it with them? So I have done that already. I've had uh, Ramapo students out on the site and I have visited Montclair State a couple of times. Um, and high school, I don't think I have been to the high school with this with this material, um, but I am open to, as you know, talking to anyone at any time. I, you know, this is something that, um, we should probably offer something like this to the high school. Well, there are no more questions in the chat. I think we're right at 1.59 or so. Okay, how about that? Well, again, I just want to thank you guys. Um, not possible without all of your help in, in many different forms and fashions. And, um, you know, hopefully we'll be back out in the field and looking at this stuff firsthand before you know it.